Right. Um, uh, welcome to the session of Vision Lab. Uh, and I received a, a bunch of questions. I just want to make sure that these are the, the actual questions <laughs> that you have sent uh, and not some other group. <laughs> uh, and so, um, I mean, usually uh, I start my conversation uh, with directly uh, Q&A, uh, but I don't any, have any slides or PowerPoints. Uh, so I can, of course, talk about the listed questions uh, right here. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me anytime. I think we do have more than one microphone. Uh, and, uh, but I just want to uh, ask, is there anything that um, any of your minds that you would like to discuss uh, outside of these questions uh, after you uh, were given a tour and had some conversation about such innovation lab, or should we dive straight into this? Yes. social entrepreneurs and citizens. I'm wondering if there's any work that's being done internally, like with other city agencies or city employees um, in terms of improving like operations and bringing more innovation to those spaces. You mean uh, where we scale horizontally to other cities? Is that the no, question? no, I or mean just like within internally within government, mm -hmm. um, whether it's like city agencies that provide social services, trying to support them in terms of um, improving those services, service delivery processes or operations, mm -hmm. your, your innovative. Yeah, although, although I'm, uh we are situated in the heart of Taipei City. Uh, this space is a national government space. Um, and so the most of the bureaucratic uh, innovations that we did is actually around the central government. Uh, and so during our um, social innovation tours, uh, which is what usually happens um, every other Tuesday around here, uh, for example, um, this is, um, here, actually. Uh, you can recognize that as one of the meeting rooms here. And sometimes it's, it's right here, like where we're at. Um, and I tour around uh, the various cities and um, indigenous places and uh, rural places to join their town halls by bringing through video conference the Social Innovation Lab and the 12 ministries to look directly at people's problems and brainstorm uh, possible solutions. And they get the credit if they innovate. Um, and I take the risk because you can't punch people across a projector screen. And so if they, anybody here says the middle face of people, um, it's me who facilitates. But in any case, that the point here is that uh, we're scaling this out horizontally. This is, um, I don't know what happened with the projector, but in any case, um, Anyway, so um, the idea here, more simply put, is that we're bringing tech to people. We're not asking people to come to the Social Innovation Lab. We're using uh, 360 um, live streaming and all sort of uh, augmented reality to bring Social Innovation Lab to the various uh, remote places. And so I think that is uh, one answer to your question. Uh, the Taipei City by itself it has a smart city uh, um, center, and, and the smart city office uh, is kind of arm's length from the Department of Information and Technologies. And we do work on several cases, for example, the self-driving vehicles that's being um, tested for a while here now. Um, self-driving tricycles, to be precise. Um, and these look like shopping baskets, which they are. Um, and we co-create with the market, like literally the Jimbo Flower Market, which is every weekend uh, around here, to um, make uh, what people uh, feel initially as kind of alien creatures. Uh, into useful uh, self-walking shopping uh, baskets that can follow people around and you can buy some orchid flowers and put it in and so on, um, co-domestication. And once we learn something from it, then we turn it into a sandbox experiment. So right now, uh, the DOIT and the Smart City Office um, is finalizing the sandbox plan for the self-driving bus, which will probably roll out April in a dedicated bus lane uh, in Taipei City and that directly takes the co-domestication norm. Uh, into what a self-driving bus uh, should do to integrate well with the society. There's also uh, various other cities like Gaoshan is doing uh, self-driving boat, solar power uh, boat, and, and things like that. So this is where uh, the ideas incubate or originates and find a social norm, but the uh, individual application is still uh, devolved into a municipal level. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, three questions. So maybe in this sequence, like proximity to microphone, please. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ines and I study uh, sustainable development at Columbia. 
I was wondering if you could give a little bit of a personal background and um, maybe explain what inspired you to take on the work that you do. Personal backgrounds. Okay, my, my background is pretty transparent. Uh, but um, yeah, so I'm a uh, like uh, autodidact. I dropped out of junior high uh, when I was 15 years old. I uh, found this great website that's still around called archive.org. Uh, and uh, that has a lot of preprints, like people posting their journal uh, article drafts. And then I started writing back and just doing research together. And then I, st I talked to the principal of my school, saying that the future of human knowledge is being created on this theme thing called it Wild Web. That was 95. And then she said, OK, tomorrow you don't have to uh, and then I dropped out as a junior high and then um, just started founding a few companies as a serial entrepreneur uh, and worked for like 20 years and then retired and then uh, joined the civil society movements and things like that, just a normal you know, serial entrepreneurship thing. Uh, hi, my name is Fatima. I'm studying development practice and I wanted to ask you Speaker shared the statistic that um, Taiwan has the lowest survival rates of startups. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could kind of mm -hmm. explain why that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yes, we, we fail fast. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that, that's true. <laughs> like, literally. Uh, the, the Taiwan startup ecosystem is centered around the idea of um, triple bottom line, which you're very familiar with, so I wouldn't take any uh, extra uh, effort to, to explain you what is the triple bottom line. So um, the point here is that uh, the startups uh, mostly need to not only make a profit, but rather to demonstrate to the society that they are also contributing to social and environmental causes. Any startup that uh, works on one uh, while sacrificing the, any of the other two uh, part of the society uh, gets into the uh, value of uh, social sanction. Uh, and in Taiwan, the social sector has higher legitimacy than private and public sector combined. Uh, and so because of that, uh, any startup wouldn't survive social sanction. Uh, and so because of that, uh, there's a lot of uh, effort uh, in the startup world to find out such uh, triple bottom line solutions. So our unicorns, for example, go go roll. Uh, they have to build themselves as a you know a mobility like so, um, uh, company like mobility as a service while solving energy storage problems, while being a battery innovator, while doing uh, renewable and solar, while reducing carbon footprint, while and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, and so it's a, it's a really um, difficult thing to do. Uh, and so uh, as soon as there's any like inkling of uh, there may be some um, sacrifices made or negative externalities made. Uh, the uh, startup co-founders uh, or founders usually just pivot. And, and by pivot, I mean just discard that idea and try something new. Uh, I did that like five times. Uh, and so because of that, um, the so-called survival rate uh, is, is very low uh, in the sense that once people understand that the product market fit creates negative externalities, it's not rewarded uh, by the uh, customer base, neither by the investors. And so that's one of the reasons. Um, sorry to interrupt. If we could ask uh, the participants to stand up while they ask your question, it would be much appreciated. And to give a quick introduction. Of, uh, oh, okay. Like just, just so that we know where the question yeah. from. Yeah. Okay. So the microphone is coming. Uh, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Brett. My colleague James has a question, but he lost his voice. Uh, he studies national security at uh, Columbia. Uh, so what social innovations have you found to have dual use purposes? Uh, that is social and national security. Uh, Pretty much everything. <laughs> I mean, everything um, can be done uh, in a kind of military lens. And so uh, just very recently, we saw the satellite imagery analysis, uh, which is, I think, originally designed to um, calculate like forest uh, coverage and uh, environmental impact. And so on is put on the export banning list of the US uh, because it could also be used uh, by uh, in a dual use fashion. Uh, and so I would say like everything, like literally. Yes, yes, a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm Rio. I'm running urban social policy. So my question about the role the government can play. So uh, I understand it's not provide a um, beneficial uh, environment for social media. But I think there's many uh, private companies that 
provide this kind of service. So my question is about what kind of unique value the government can provide. Well, I'm sure that the private sectors are really good at like accelerators and incubators, but I don't think a private sector uh, incubator can say that uh, feel free to violate existing law and regulation for a year and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> They probably get put into prison if they say that. But, uh, but uh, because Taiwan, uh, although we're a continental law uh, system, which means that everything has to be uh, written uh, and authorized by the parliament, we nevertheless have a very progressive parliament that authorizes uh, various sandbox acts. So in self driving, in platform economy, in fintech, in 5G, uh, whatever, uh, you can uh, break the law and break, challenge existing regulations for a year in the hope that your idea can convince the society after a year that your alternate regulation is a better one compared to the previous one. Uh, and then during the sandbox uh, period, people of course need to look very carefully at whether these um, new innovations, for example, uh, using your phone instead of going to the bank to pay, open a bank account, using your telecom bills instead of your previous payment bills to calculate uh, the loans, uh, quota, things like that. Uh, that's the FinTech one. Or uh, self-driving buses have already talked about that and, and so on. Um, and, and just recently emerging out of the sandbox uh, is uh, telecommunication for psychiatric uh, consultations, um, like many ones, uh, literally too many to, to remember. But uh, in each and every of these cases, the government can play a facilitative role in the sense of uh, not uh, anticipating social response, but helping to communicate to stakeholders and to listen at scale. And if it turns out that their idea really is good, then uh, after a year when it emerges out of sandbox, we just take their fork, their new version of the regulation as our regulation, that's the commitment we can give. And every single ministry's any regulation is fair game, well, with the two exceptions of money laundering and funding terrorism, because we know what happens if you do those two things. We don't have to do experiments, but everything else is fair game. Question from the audience? Oh, yes. Uh, Hi, my name is Max. I am from California. Hi. But I was born here. And I have a question for you. And that question is How do you think office layout and school layout in terms of design can be, um, can be uh, implemented, can be designed to maximize innovation and the innate potential of the student and um, office worker? Thank you. Okay, right. So, um, as you can probably feel, the social innovation here is not just, it's multi-use. Uh, so it could be used in, in, in every which way. Uh, most of our space here doesn't have a designated structure or designated layout. It could be repurposed uh, you know, according to the need uh, of the events at play. Uh, so, uh, and that describes also the entire C lab, uh, which the SI lab is just one part of. So if you uh, walk diagonally to the uh, Jingle Flower Market site, uh, you can uh, experience, for example, the sound lab, uh, which uh, there's no reverb or any of the reflection of the sound there. Uh, and if you close your eyes and they play the sound, you can feel you're transported to one bar or to any of the other places. That is the space for, for immersive uh, experience. But then if you open your eyes, it's just an empty place uh, with a lot of uh, like um, sound systems. So basically, uh, we designed the entire uh, C-Lab and um, to, uh, because SI-Lab opened uh, first, so um, to a more advanced form in SI-Lab, uh, this sense of uh, a malleable space uh, that is designed to do a what we call a recursive public, meaning that anybody who step into this space is a co-creator of the space if they feel that uh, people with Down syndrome uh, paint the space uh, and in a more creative fashion uh, then uh, we with our trism and differences we can see this feeling but all we see is lines and boxes and, and abstractions right but the people with Down syndrome <coughs> see the topology and geometry uh, behind them. 
And so actually we, we then replaced the, the uh, lines and boxes with their vision uh, and then uh, people are entering into a much more creative uh, mindset when they step into this space. And so uh, because every Wednesday I'm here like from 10 a.m. to the evening, uh, anybody can just come and talk to me and change the space. And so <clears throat> having the space itself be a social technology for the social technologists to innovate and when they're done uh, innovating and talking about things and holding concurrent events like by 9 p.m. every day there's usually something very tasty in the kitchen and uh, the kitchen opens until 11 in the midnight uh, and so people can uh, at least have a good feeling a effect a positive effect even if the innovation is pretty prototypical like doesn't quite work uh, but uh, after a week they, they're compelled to, to go back here to enjoy the food even though they forgot about the innovation. Uh, and so I think that is very important that after like five concurrent events being held, people can mingle together in excellent uh, food and drink and atmosphere uh, for no particular purpose in a kind of open space technology. So uh, I think having the space itself as a social object that people can improve on, I think offers uh, the most chance uh, of innovation. That's the answer to your question. Uh, there was a question here, I think. Is you? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Nidia, um, and I study urban policy. Um, so another question I have is that, um, so a lot of these government innovation initiatives, whether it's in the US, the digital service, or gov.uk with their digital service, um, really it's the effort to break down barriers to civic participation and the assumption is that um, the easier it is to participate in government, people will and the more people um, participate, the better the policy outcomes would be. Well, at least it's more fun, but yes. Right, do you necessarily agree with this based on your experience and when were times where you felt that wasn't true? No, I'm optimistic for fun, so. Um, it's always more fun. I don't know about the quality, but it's fun. So, uh, but but I mean that is important because there's um, things with more um, appeal nowadays. Anyone uh, like waiting in lines used to be a boring thing, but then social media and uh, mobile phones gets invented, and people are perfectly fine waiting in line because. <laughs> Also, online, um, right? So basically, uh, what what this changes in the social configuration is that people no longer need a physical space, a physical representative, or a physical council uh, to work together on social production issues with the right hashtag. Um, hundreds of millions of you know people who don't know each other nevertheless establish swift trust and then uh, coordinate on. Um, Hashtag me too, hashtag climate strike, hashtag you name it, right? So all these means that uh, if democracy or governance institutions do not uh, use the same um, attitude of working with people, and instead uh, if they keep remaining saying we're working for people, uh, then they are no longer relevant. People will then only feel democracy once every two years or four years, and people will only feel democracy in a very small amount of information, like five bits every two years years, that's called voting, uh, and basically that then will make uh, democracy itself not relevant in people's collective imagination, so it become fossilized and ritualized. And once it becomes ritualized, the governance lose, lose the fun of it, and then uh, people won't feel that the public uh, forum or public endeavors or whatever uh, is something that was investing their, their time on, and so no people will then feel that they contribute to the public space uh, forming discussions. They will just follow what is institutionalized as so-called model of democracy. Uh, and so that then gave rise to a exclusionary populism because then people who feel excluded by existing institutions, and there's always such people, um, will then uh, be incentivized to join the hashtags that are quote unquote anti-establishment, meaning to tear down the barriers too, but from the outside uh, and, and not from the inside. And, and then that uh, creates an atmosphere in which that the 
democracy um, feels that there really is no easy way out uh, from this exclusionary populism. So what I just described is pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, so if democracy doesn't make it so fun and take the barriers from within, uh, like we are tearing down the walls, like literally now, so that you can already walk in from the street to bus, and you can walk in from the entire street uh, nearby, uh, then that uh, cease. Uh, if we don't do that, then this ceases to be relevant to people. It, it's my answer. So uh, it could even be interpreted as a survival thing. It's not just um, to uh, like make wild experiments or whatever. This is about democracy being still relevant to people. There's a question. Well, okay. Yeah. Whomever has the microphone. Um, so you just mentioned exclusion, and uh, my question is that often critiques of social innovation spaces is that they're male dominated. Mm -hmm. So what steps is the government taking to ensuring diversity within social innovation mm -hmm. related to gender? Right, so we're, we're perhaps um, very blessed here because after 12 years of gender mainstreaming, uh, we're now like having um, problems, uh, for example, about convincing boys to participate in programming. Uh, <laughs> so like the reverse problem. Uh, but, but I think that there's a few things going on here, right? First is that we have 12 years of gender mainstreaming. And so um, we have pretty good uh, ratio, like not quite Nordic, but uh, very, uh, very close to that uh, when it comes to um, gender balance in the parliaments. And we also have a gender dashboard that for each uh, project and each bill that the government does, they have to contribute to the measurements of inequality. And that then forms the theory of change. So that for each policy, it could be labor policy, financial policy, whatever policy, they have to fill this extremely long form that uh, calculates exactly how much uh, impact on gender uh, it, this policy will have. And it gets reviewed by a uh, council, the Gender Equality Council, that is by design more civil society leaders than ministers uh, in it. And then they have to collaboratively uh, contribute this measurement. Even after the projects and bills have run its course, uh, you can continue to look at the measurements in inequality. Uh, so that builds a evidence uh, policy um, system and all the public service, regardless of how which department they are in, they are thoroughly aware of the gender impact that their policies do. And so that is uh, why, after the Constitutional Court ruling and the two referenda, we can settle on a marriage equality bill in very, very short time that addresses all the design constraints. And uh, that also makes it easier for us. We're designing our innovation policies to look at existing measurements of inequality and design our innovations uh, policies around that. So, uh, in my field, which is uh, programming, uh, in, um, in Taiwan we translate programming as like literally program design and not software engineering or anything that conjures this construction worker uh, um, with all, all due respect image. Uh, and so uh, basically as designers, it is actually seen as a slightly more feminine uh, profession, uh, just like fashion designer and, and things like that. And so uh, we're working hard to keep boys interested <laughs> in programming design. And so fortunately, uh, in around my lines of work and around the incubators or incubatees here, uh, we don't have that much of a problem when it comes to gender balance. And we're, we intend to keep it this way, always the gender impact dashboard. Yes. Uh, another question from James. Um, so in what ways do you find as a, political, as a public official, has the Chinese government been trying to make democracy more fun and engaging? And how successful has that been? Uh, and also in the U.S., we've seen sort of a crackdown on political participation uh, due to voter restriction mm -hmm. policies. Uh, is there anything similar in Taiwan? Uh -huh. uh, so no, but <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, um, uh, funny games. Uh, yes, so uh, it is uh, actually a lot of uh, work to do mimetic engineering and phrase all our uh, conversations around, say, uh, rumors and uh, clarifications. Because, um, so this is election time, but even in non-election time, there's a lot of uh, disinformation around because Taiwan is, according to the 
civic monitor, uh, the place with the most civic space in terms of freedom to assemble and, and speech and whatever around our part of Earth, I think all the way to Africa. Uh, so we're the only one that has a completely open civic space. The nearest one is New Zealand. Uh, but in any case, um, this means that whenever we look at uh, people who want to decimate people's interest in democracy, uh, which is about, for example, precision targeting messages that discourage people to vote or whatever um, the current trend is, uh, or spread disinformation that try to undermine uh, people's trust uh, with each other, uh, we have the relevant ministries roll out clarification messages using memetic engineering to make sure that their clarification messages are fun and are viral by themselves. Uh, because if we don't have to, it actually only reinforces stereotypes and, and does nobody any good. Uh, and so within two hours, they're required to write 200 characters or less in at least two pictures uh, to clarify any part of the rumor to uh, help people understand more of the political context. So this is one example. There was a popular rumor that says, put me on hell within a week multiple times will be subject to one million dollar fine next week, and, which is not true. And uh, the prime minister, a younger version of him, says I may be bought now, but I will not punish people here. Uh, and a fine print that says, well, we've done this, we'll introduce a labeling requirement for hair products that takes effect on 2021. And the prime minister, as he looks now, says that, however, if you perm your hair many times a week, you will not damage your pocket, but you will damage your hair. If it's quite serious, you may look like this. So um, it's really funny. And, and if, if you uh, laugh, then uh, really there is, is a kind of mutually exclusive pathways in the mind that you cannot uh, feel fun and humor if you are feeling anger to outrage. On the other hand, if people see this picture first and turn anger into humor, into fun, they cannot feel outrage. Uh, and so because these are two different pathways, the idea is that having a viral message that is humorous, uh, that makes fun at the expense of himself, not other people, but good humor, um, it dominates like search engines. If you search for uh, Premier Hair Fine, you will find this picture and not the original disinformation package, so that it goes more viral than the disinformation and inoculates people's mind against this social outrage thing. And then people can start talking in a more rational fashion about what exactly this labeling requirement do, which is, of course, the beginning of democratic discourse. But if people are already feeling outrage, there is no room for democratic discourse. So fun, very important, and we have professionals in each ministry working on this. Sorry, I'd like to ask the question as myself, if that's okay. Uh, my name is Britt. I'm also studying uh, national security here at Columbia. Uh, if it's not too personal a question, I was wondering, uh, we haven't had the chance on this trip yet to hear uh, the perspective of someone who is LGBTQ and so much in the public eye. Um, and we know that you know, the DPP has had rather progressive uh, positions on, on LGBTQ issues in, in Taiwan, but what has your experience been when you're so much a public figure uh, and with the elections coming up, how do you see the future of LGBTQ rights and representation if for example, the DPP doesn't manage to secure a majority in the legislative Yeah, I think the LGBTQIA plus, whatever, uh, is, <laughs> um, it is uh, gaining uh, a lot of ground in Taiwan in the past decade or so, that's for sure. Uh, and I think actually Dr. Tsai Ing-wen's uh, presidency uh, really helped in, in one key way in, in that when she, uh, for example, shares this message. Um, She's not sharing this from a kind of LGBTQ activism uh, point of view, but rather a, a love one uh, point of view, like equality point of view, which is important because in Taiwan, different generations have different ideas about marriage. Before 2007, uh, marriage could be done by social ceremony, meaning two families holding a ceremony together uh, give uh, legitimacy, legal legitimacy to the wedding. Uh, even before the household registration. Uh, and so social ceremony wedding is a thing, and marriage was seen as a marriage between two families, not just two persons. Um, and it's informed a lot of people's, the elderly people's view on marriage until 2008, where marriage is defined as purely by registration and therefore between two individuals. And so um, a lot of the conversation uh, and indeed confusion around marriage equality is the two definitions of marriages. Uh, the first one has like 10 different words for aunts and uncles. Uh, and uh, people fear that they have to reinvent another 
12 words, uh, just to describe marriage equality, kinship relationships, uh, whereas the people who have uh, subscribed to the registration theory thinks that it's just between two individuals, so it's obviously a equality thing. And so that is why at the end of the uh, legislation, the so-called hyperlink act, uh, it is uh, chosen to hyperlink only to the part of the civil code that has the rights and duties, uh, the um, bylaws of marriage, instead of the kinship clause, which is not hyperlinked, the in-laws of marriage is not included. So we legalize the bylaw and none of the in-laws uh, are in Mandarin. That is uh, our approach to marriage equality, so marriage equality with Asian characteristics, uh, and that actually uh, exports really well to Thailand or to uh, Japan or, or whatever. And, and so my point here is that uh, she's tackling this in a decidedly cross-generational kind of taking all the sides view instead of a very activist uh, to hell with the elders uh, view. And this is important. And so I think that is a really good balanced approach. And I, uh, I think this will continue uh, regardless of uh, the election results of the members of the parliament because people are seeing that their kinship relations are being respected even after the hyperlink law is passed. And activists also understand that we need to respect the social ceremonies when the, the, our elders are wed. I mean, they wed the two families. That, that is just a historical fact, right? And so we need to respect that as well. And so I'm um, cautiously optimistic, I think, uh, when it comes to LGBTIQA plus rights. So it looks like we have time for one last question. So here's one, yeah. <coughs> Very much. My name is Lily Kiba. I'm from Germany. I study energy and um, what about time conservation, energy and environment. And my question is to you as a serial entrepreneur, having transferred into uh, the government uh, or politics, what do you see as the biggest challenges and obstacles governments um, create for entrepreneurship? And what would you recommend uh, governments across the world to implement in order to enhance entrepreneurship? And adding to that, what can international or Western governments and Europe, for example, learn from Taiwan to enable more social um, and general entrepreneurship? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of the governments take a uh, kind of linear view or, or even zero-sum view when it comes to innovation on one side and say social justice on the other or economic development on one side and environmental sustainability on the other. I, I can go on but, but that is kind of the, the traditional like zero-sum like uh, number of seats or whatever. Uh, whenever there's a finite resource, there's kind of this view of one minister here, one minister there, lobbies here, lobbies there, uh, kind of view. And I think this is um, detrimental to social entrepreneurs because kind of by definition, social entrepreneurship is about finding out innovations that uh, takes the strength from all the different sectors and co-create new values that people can uh, accept or at least live with uh, while keeping their original positions and things that are good for all the stakeholders involved. And so I think uh, the one thing that government need to do is to switch to a view that the government is actually not asking who are the representative and what is the trade-off, which is unanswerable if people organize through hashtag anyway. Uh, and so instead we need to ask Given the different positions, are there common values after all? And given the common values, are there innovations that work for everyone, even though it breaks some laws and regulations? And then we change our laws and regulations too much. And so, um, in terms of how come I can help, well, we can help on all 17 goals, but uh, this is my kind of job description. <laughs> well, three years ago, when I became digital minister, the HR asked me, uh, Minister, what does digital minister do? Because it's a new role, right? So I'm like, so this is just target 17, 18, 17. And six, which is uh, reliable data, active partnership, and open innovation, uh, and which is great. But uh, the SDGs were just rolled out in 2015. So in 2016, nobody memorized those uh, in, in their head. And so the HR is like, no, you can't just give me three numbers. Uh, you, know, you have to write something that's more and more legible to, to people. Uh, and so because I, uh, as a serial entrepreneur, I understand 
if you take a mechanistic view on technology, people tend to think in a linear zero-sum fashion. And so changing that zero-sum fashion into a co-creation of innovation is the key. So I wrote a prayer, really a poem, uh, as my job description, which I'll read to you now. So my job description literally means, when we see the internet of science, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you so much. Uh, prepare a small gift.